At this point in the term, you should be planning and drafting your paper. In this lecture, I want to give you some tips for how to do that. First, you need to be determining the big picture. The storyboard is really useful for this because you can lay out your whole paper, or at least an outline of it. You can see it all at one time. And so you can think about what's the overall flow of how I want to present my argument in the paper from beginning to end. And then once you get that laid out, you can focus on the structure of individual sections of your paper. We talk about arguing your case. We don't mean where people are yelling at each other and using profanity. It means uh, arguing is think about a, an attorney presenting his or her case in court. So as you are presenting evidence in your paper, you'll be carrying the reader along because you are presenting the information in a logical format that the reader can follow. Now, it's one thing for you to write a paper and be able to understand it. It's more difficult for someone else to follow your line of thought. And that's where the work and the revision comes in in writing a paper. If someone says a section of your paper is not clear, don't defend yourself. It isn't clear. Fix it. Part of arguing your case that you have to be concerned about is your overall credibility as an author. And the readers will perceive you as being more reasonable if you're not shrill and one-sided, if you have picked a controversial topic. And they'll also perceive you as being more credible if you present authoritative references to back up the claims you make in your paper. For elements of argument, the first one is logos. And this is just from English, basic English 1301. This is the reason and logic of an argument. So this is backing up any kind of claim you make in the paper with an authoritative source that you cite. It is having a logical order to your paper. All of that builds the logos element of your argument, and that's very important in an academic research paper. Another is, uh, element of argument is pathos. This is emotional appeal, appealing to needs, to values, and desires. Politicians are very good at doing this, as well as advertisers. And in the folder for this week, I have a little video clip of President Reagan making a short speech. There's a reason he was called a great communicator, and he certainly called on his experience in acting and being able to put over ideas, but also to appeal to people's emotions, to their needs, their values, their desires. He was very good at doing that. So I want you to take a look at that video and think about what is he doing in the video that lends itself to appealing to people's emotions and values. Ethos, well this is back to credibility. This is your overall credibility and reliability as an author. It's really important to think about your references at this point because if you have a wonderfully reasonable argument presented in a logical order but your sources are from the National Enquirer you're, going to, you're in trouble because you're, you have a foundational element that is crumbling. Another thing that can hurt ethos is to not have a concisely stated point for your paper. That will be in the form of a research question. Every good sermon should have a point and every good paper should have a point. If you don't express that early in the paper, you will set your readers adrift and you will lose credibility in their eyes. So in writing a paper like this, you need to major on logos, because it's an academic research paper, and 
Appealing to emotion is important, but do that judiciously. And when you do those two things, your ethos, your credibility as an author, will follow. Think of pathos like salt in a recipe. A little is good, too much will ruin the dish. It's good to have a hook sometimes in the introduction to appeal to people's emotions. A student in the past term in my regular research methods class um, decided that he was going to write his paper on cockpit communication because he was an air ambulance pilot. And as he was uh, doing this research, I thought to myself, this sounds like the most boring topic in the world. It went from being boring to being very interesting because in his introduction, he appealed to emotion. Now, he didn't do it a whole lot, but after the opening section, he had everybody's attention. He talked about in the 60s, a 707 passenger jet full of fuel, nothing wrong with the, air, with the aircraft at all. There was a warning light that came on in the cockpit. All of the pilots, the pilot and co-pilots were looking at the blinking light and they bumped the yoke, took the plane off autopilot and it crashed into the Everglades and killed everyone, not because there was anything wrong with the aircraft, but because no one was flying it. Now, after that kind of a story, that kind of case study that he actually cited, he had everybody's attention. So pathos can be very important to hook your audience and convince them that you are worth listening to. So don't underestimate the power of that, but don't dwell on it. If you keep doing it through the paper, if you keep making appeals to emotion, they'll, your reader will start to say, well, they're just trying to manipulate me. So it's good for a hook, but don't keep doing it. For logical fallacies, you need to be alert to these. One is called an ad hominem argument. And the ad hominem argument is the writer rejecting opposing views by attacking the person who holds them. This is a personal attack, not about issues. And, and by the way, politicians are very good at doing this too. Uh, you call your opponent names and um, by doing that, you avoid the issue of what it is they're trying to present. Here's an example, and this is from a political speech. I could more easily accept my opponent's plan to increase revenues by collecting on delinquent tax bills if he had paid more than $100 in state taxes in each of the past three years. But the fact is, he's a millionaire with a millionaire's tax shelters. This man hasn't paid a wooden nickel for the state services he and his family depend on. So I ask you, is he the one to be talking about taxes to us? So that's an ad hominem argument. The next is faulty cause and effect. And this is uh, just the fact that one event precedes another in time doesn't necessarily mean that the first event caused the second. So here's an example. Fish start to die by the thousands in a lake near your hometown. And so an environmental group comes in. And they say that someone has been dumping chemicals into the lake and that is what is causing the die-off. The problem with that is other causes are possible. There may have been some kind of disease that affected the fish. It had nothing to do with chemicals. Or the growth of algae may have contributed to the death. Or or acid rain might be a factor. There's lots of things going on here, so you can't say that something caused another thing because that's just simplifying things too much. Hasty generalization is the next one. And this is, uh, well, writers are guilty of this when they draw their conclusions from too little evidence or either that or unrepresentative evidence. So we could say that, uh, to argue that scientists should not proceed with the ge human genome project because a recent editorial urge that the project be abandoned is to make a hasty generalization. Because the person who wrote that lone editorial may be a unrepresentative of the views of most individuals, both scientists and lay peoples, who have studied and written about the issue. And so that is the hasty generalization. False analogy is comparing one person, event, or issue 
to another. Um, and of course, when you do that, it can be illuminating, but it can also be misleading. So the differences between uh, the two may be more significant than their similarities. And the conclusion drawn from one may not necessarily apply to another. So we could say, uh, let's say a candidate for governor or president who argues that her experience as a CEO of a major business would make her effective in governing a state or country. That is assuming an analogy between business and the political world that does not hold up to examination because it's very different being a CEO and being in government leadership. So uh, that is a false analogy. Another is begging a question. The beg question is to assume as a proven fact the thesis being argued. This is also called circular reasoning, by the way. So to assert, for example, that America does not need a new health care delivery system because America currently has the best health care in the world doesn't actually prove anything. It merely repeats the claim in a different and equally unproven words. Non sequitur is Latin for it does not follow. And this term is used to describe a conclusion that does not logically follow from a premise. So here's an example. Since minorities have made such great strides in the past few decades, we no longer need affirmative action programs. Aside from the fact that the premise itself is arguable, that is, have minorities made such great strides, it does not follow that because minorities may have made great strides, there is no further need for affirmative action programs. And the last one is oversimplification. This is where a writer offers an easy solution to a complicated problem. Here's an example. America's economy will be strong again if we all buy American. But the problem is, if you look at some things that are assembled in America, their parts are made in lots of different countries and they're just shipped here and assembled here. So what does it mean to, be, to buy American? Also, the, the problems of the American economy are uh, complicated and they can't be solved by a simple change in buying habits or a slogan. So uh, that's a case of oversimplification. In the folder for this week, I have something uh, by, written by John Holt. He was part of the de-schooling movement in the 1970s along with Ivan Illich. He advocated for eliminating public schools because children are good and wise. And if we eliminate schools, it will help not to warp children's minds. And this is an excerpt from his book, Escape from Childhood. I want you to read it. And read it as you read. Look for some of these logical fallacies we've just talked about. And we'll talk about that this week. As you go through your outline or storyboard, think about how will you support your major points. I look for some kind of reference, a footnote, in at least every paragraph. Every sentence is better. The point is, you can't make any kind of assertion in your paper, in a research paper, without backing it up with an authoritative reference. So if you tell me, you know, how many churches there are in the Southern Baptist Convention, following that had better be a footnote of some report from the Southern Baptist Convention that uh, reports how many churches there are. You can't just pull the claim out of the air. Chapter 5 of the Turabian Guide, this is pages 49 through 62, covers uh, arguments and warrants and how, uh, and so the question I have for you uh, the two questions I have for you that we're going to discuss this week is what is a warrant and how is an argument based on evidence different from an argument based on warrants? I want you to write out both the answers to those questions in your own words. Don't just copy what's in the book because I want you to really think about this and play with those ideas in your words, uh, play with those ideas in your mind 
and you know it, this is really a helpful chapter it's not very long so please read it I think it'll clarify a lot of things uh, for you chapter 6 this is page 63 through 72 after reading this chapter I want you to provide a preliminary explanation of what you hope to demonstrate in your research paper and remember less is more I want your explanation to be no more than 100 words brevity is a soul of wit sometimes if you are forced to express your ideas more efficiently they become more clear